Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. The Alaskan Wilderness. Some say it's the last frontier on Earth. Its massive size and extreme isolation make it a perfect spot for people who want to disappear or to live alone, separated from society. Those same qualities also make it the perfect spot to hide things. For a man like Robert Hansen, it became not only his hunting ground, but his dumping ground. He hunted his victims like wild game through the mountains and trees of Alaska and terrorized one of the toughest cities in the country. This is the case of the serial killer known as the Butcher Baker. Let's get into it. June 13, 1983. A 17 year old sex worker named Cindy Paulson gets into a car with a customer. The customer was a smallish man who spoke quietly and she did not see him as any kind of a threat. But as soon as she was inside the car, the man pulled a gun on her and placed her in handcuffs. The man then drove Cindy to his house. He took her inside and she was horrified to see a large chain hanging from the ceiling of the room. The walls of the room were covered in taxidermy animal heads and gun racks. The man shackled Cindy to the large chain and left her there for hours as he repeatedly raped and tortured her. After this ordeal, the man released Cindy from the chain. She was only partially dressed, so he threw a blanket around her shoulders and forced her outside and back into his car. They began to drive. As she sat huddled in the back seat of the car, Cindy slipped her shoes off and kicked them under the front seat. She was trying to leave evidence behind to prove she had been there because she knew she was about to disappear. The man drove Cindy to a small local airport called Merrill Field. He told her that if she moved or tried anything, he would kill her. He left her in the car as he began loading items into a small bush plane. One of those items was a hunting rifle. Cindy's mind flashed back to the room with the chain in it and the many, many taxidermied animals on the wall. This man was a hunter and he was preparing to hunt her. She knew it was now or never. When he turned his back for a moment, Cindy bolted from the car barefoot and in her underwear. She ran as fast as she could towards Fifth Avenue. It was only five in the morning, but fortunately for Cindy, a car was just passing by and it stopped for her. The man saw her get into the car and they locked eyes as the car drove Cindy away. The man then ran back to his car and peeled out of the airport. His squealing tires and Cindy running across the pavement in her underwear got the attention of an airport security guard who noted the make and model of the car. The Good Samaritan who picked Cindy up was a man named Robert Yount. He asked Cindy where she wanted to go. She told him to take her to the Mush Inn, a nearby motel. As Cindy walked into the motel, the desk clerk noticed that not only was she half dressed, but that she had handcuffs on. Cindy asked the desk clerk to call her boyfriend at the Big Timber Motel that was nearby. The desk clerk did call the Big Timber Motel, but they also called the police. The police got a second call from Robert Yount when he got to work, explaining to them what he had witnessed. When the police arrived at the Mush Inn, the clerk told them Cindy had taken a cab to the Big Timber Motel, so they went to find her there. Cindy Paulson provided a very detailed report of what had happened to her. She told the officers where the house was located, the color and make of the car she had been in. She gave a good description of the man and told her where she had been picked up from. The police put Cindy in a car to take her to the hospital as this is protocol for victims of sexual assault. As they were in the car, they drove past the airfield and Cindy pointed out the plane that the man was loading items into, still sitting right where it had been earlier. The security guard saw the police looking at the plane and came over to them. He told them he had witnessed part of the scene between the man and Cindy and wanted to give the police the license plate number he had taken down when the man squealed out of the parking lot. So you're like, okay, this is great. The witness was bright and gave great details. A security guard was alert and did the right thing by taking down information and then sharing that with the police. This is an open and shut case, right? But we're just at the beginning of the episode. So 
If you're like me, you might want to make a nice soothing cup of tea because what I'm about to tell you will get your blood boiling. Cindy goes off to the hospital and the police look up the owner of the car using the license plate number the security guard provided them. They find out that the owner of the car and the owner of the plane is a man named Robert Hansen. The police went to Robert's home and told him they were there to investigate the claims made not only by Cindy, but by the security guard and the Good Samaritan driver. The chain wasn't where Cindy said it would be hanging from the ceiling, and Robert Hansen had cleaned his car. Her shoes weren't where she said she left them. Robert calmly and quietly told the police that he had picked Cindy up for her services and that when he did, she had tried to extort more money from him and threatened that if he didn't pay her, she was going to call the police. He also told the police, besides, I don't understand how it's possible to rape a prostitute. Oh, oh. The police pulled Robert Hansen's criminal record. They see that he has been arrested several times on two different occasions up in Alaska. The crimes were, you know, burglary. They were kind of serious. So it all adds up, right? This is maybe a violent guy who is maybe hurting women and they're thankful to get him off the street, right? Sadly, no. What do the police do? Do they hold Robert Hansen as they go get a search warrant so they can go through his car and his plane and his home? Do they take him in for questioning? Nope. After talking with him, they put in their reports that the man is quiet and demure and doesn't seem threatening at all. They note that he is a baker and decorates cakes for a living, and he hardly seems like the type to do something like this. Several of the police officers actually knew Robert because they would frequent his bakery to get donuts on a regular basis. Cindy is just a lowly prostitute in their eyes. This man, Robert Hansen, the baker, then gets his friend John Hennig to call the police and tell them that he was with him earlier in the day, so it couldn't have been him that did these terrible things to Cindy. Despite all of the evidence, despite Cindy's detailed account of exactly what happened to her and a security guard witnessing her escape, despite Robert Hansen's criminal record, nothing is done. The list of questions I have is much too long to go into here, but there's one I had that I kind of couldn't get past. How does a man who works as a baker afford a house, a car, and a plane? Not only that, but the guy also owns hundreds of guns, because of course he does, and he's got taxidermy pieces all over his house. Do you know how much it costs to taxidermy a deer head? It ain't cheap. But everything that I kept reading about Robert Hansen said he was a baker. He worked at a bakery. Well, after a lot of digging, I found out that Robert Hansen had actually opened his own bakery, and it was a huge success. He employed quite a few people. So a lot of what you read about Robert Hansen being a baker who just decorated cakes and baked bread, that's not actually correct. He did go into work every day, and he did continue to do the work of a baker, but he made his money because he owned the bakery, and it was apparently a very successful one. This makes him even more terrifying. He's not Ed Gein. He's not Richard Chase, living in a filthy house, you know, doing drugs and acting crazy. This man is a respected business owner with a thriving company, a wife and kids. He looks not only like most people on the outside, but he's more successful than a lot of people. Besides the fact that he stuttered, he was just an average guy and he definitely fooled most of the police. Cindy's case is basically suspended. Nothing is done to this man, Robert Hansen. Cindy moves away and almost everyone forgets about it. Everyone but an officer named Greg Baker. Officer Baker believes Cindy. He sees a very street smart young woman who is terrified. He knows she isn't lying. He doesn't have the evidence that he needs and there is little he can do when the Anchorage Police Department suspends the case without doing anything. But Officer Baker does not forget about Cindy, and he does not forget about Robert Hansen, the baker. Let's talk a little bit about this baker, Robert Hansen. He was born in 1939 in Esterville, Iowa, to Danish immigrants. His father was a baker, and that's how Robert learned the trade. He was painfully shy, and like I mentioned earlier, he stuttered. The stutter caused him a lot of problems growing up. He did not fit in at school, and he was not social. We see this time and again. As Robert matured, he developed severe acne that left his face permanently scarred. 
Robert's father was very domineering and some say abusive. So again, red flags all over the place here. Domineering parents, someone who feels like an outcast that isn't treated very nicely by their peers. And then Robert discovers a love of weapons. And that becomes not a healthy hobby, not something to learn about and be interested in, but it becomes an obsession. Robert started to get into hunting. He loved to hunt and shoot animals, and then he saved up and bought bow hunting equipment as well. He would spend hours alone in the woods practicing shooting both his guns and his bow. There are a lot of stories about how Robert would try and talk to girls, but he was made fun of because of his stutter and because of his small size and his acne. Now, this is obviously very sad. No one should be made fun of because there is something different about them. This happens to a lot of people, but unfortunately, Robert Hansen had other factors in his life that made his experience with women turn out to be very deadly for females that had absolutely nothing to do with what happened to him earlier in his life. In 1957, Robert Hansen enlisted in the army and served for a year before he was discharged. After he got out of the army, he worked as a drill instructor and firearms expert for a police academy in Pocahontas, Iowa. So again, another red flag here, we've got someone who sees a uniform and the power that it brings that is attracted to law enforcement and police work. If you're new to this channel, I discuss this a lot. Of course, not all people who are attracted to law enforcement have bad intentions, but because we see this attraction over and over in bad people, bad men in most cases, it is something that cannot be ignored. While Robert is working at the police academy, he meets a younger woman and they get married in the summer of 1960. December 7th, 1960. Robert Hansen is arrested for burning down a school bus garage near the Pocahontas County Board of Education building. He went there one night with gasoline, soaked the ground around the building, and lit it on fire. Another red flag, arson. Why? It was his revenge against the school for his unpopularity in high school. Now, I can't wrap my mind around how the school bus garage or any school building has anything to do with his unpopularity in school, but this is the mind of a madman killer, so I suppose I shouldn't expect things to make sense. Robert is put on trial and sentenced to three years in prison at Anamosa State Penitentiary. He ends up only doing 20 months of that three-year sentence, but while he is in prison, he is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which back then was called manic depression. The doctors also stated that Robert had periodic schizophrenic episodes. That's confusing to me. It's my understanding that schizophrenia is a disease that you either have or you don't. I didn't know you could have episodes. Perhaps that's something that's possible when you have bipolar disorder. If any of you know more about that, please feel free to share in the comments. The same psychiatrist who diagnosed Robert said he had, quote, infantile personality and was obsessed with getting back at people he felt had wronged him. While he was in prison for arson, Robert's wife divorced him. He was released, like I said, after 20 months, and for the next few years, he floats from job to job and was arrested several times for theft. He got remarried in 1963 to a woman named Darla Henrichson, and he and his new wife moved to Anchorage, Alaska. The couple had two children together. Darla had a master's degree in education and worked with children who had learning disabilities. She used her income to support herself and the children. Robert Hansen never helped pay for the children's needs. He used his money for what he called his own needs. From everything I read, it seems like their relationship was not a happy one and Robert was anything but a great husband and father. December 1971. Now living in Anchorage, Alaska, Robert Hansen is arrested twice in the same year. He is first arrested for abducting and attempting to rape an unidentified woman and is then arrested again for raping a sex worker. He pleaded no contest and was sentenced to five years in prison. Darla, his wife, supported Robert during this period of time and kept the household running. After only six months, Robert was placed on a work release program and allowed to live in a halfway house. 
He was again arrested in 1976 for stealing a chainsaw from an Anchorage Fred Meyer store. And again, he was sentenced to five years in prison and is ordered to get treatment for his bipolar disorder. The court then reduced his sentence and he was released for time served. This is frustrating. We have a dangerous man here. He sets fires, he steals, he abducts women, he rapes women, he has a mental illness that he isn't being monitored for, and yet he is allowed to continue with very little, if any, supervision. I've said this many times before, I'm sympathetic to people with mental illnesses, I suffer from depression, and I do believe in second chances. But I am often frustrated by the fact that many times, it seems that the freedoms of the offender and the rights of the offender are given more consideration than the freedoms and the rights of the people that they hurt. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but it is a common theme in these cases that I cover and I see it over and over. When someone is a repeat and chronic offender, I just feel strongly that we have got to do better in protecting the public from them. If they have a proven track record of dangerous behavior, they need to be monitored and we don't do such a great job of that. Part of the reason I do this, and I like to talk about it with you guys. Robert Hansen is allowed to continue his daily life despite the multiple crimes he has committed. July 17, 1980. A crew working near power lines on Eklunta Road in Anchorage discover the skeletonized remains of a woman. Her body was decomposed, indicating she had been there for at least several months. She had on a brown leather jacket, a knitted sleeveless shirt, and jeans. She was also wearing red knee-high stiletto zip-up boots. She had a packet of Salem matches in her pocket and was wearing several pieces of jewelry, including a handmade bracelet with three turquoise stones, a copper necklace, and gold-plated hoop earrings. At autopsy, it was discovered that she was most likely of Native American heritage. She was very small, only around five feet tall, the police worked for months to identify this woman, but they were not successful in finding out who she was. August 13, 1982. Two off-duty Anchorage police officers were hunting moose near the Knick River, which is about 20 miles from downtown Anchorage. As they walked through the forest, they saw something that was out of place. They soon realized it was a human skeleton partially buried in the dirt. Being police officers, they knew not to touch the remains. They notified police, and the next day, a forensics unit was sent to the site of the body. As the remains were uncovered, investigators found a 223 shell casing near the body. The remains were taken to the laboratory, and dental records were used to identify the person. The body belonged to 23-year-old Sherry Morrow, a dancer who had been reported missing a year earlier by her boyfriend. He identified the clothing found with the body, but told the police something was missing. Sherry always wore a gold arrowhead pendant necklace. She said it was her good luck charm and she never took it off. Police did not find that anywhere in the search near the body. Sherry Morrow and the body found on Eklunta Road are the first bodies found, but in the year following the discovery of these remains, more bodies begin turning up around the Knick River. It is not uncommon, apparently, to find bodies in the Alaskan wilderness, but they are usually those of people who become lost while hunting or hiking. These were the bodies of women who had been murdered and either dumped or partially buried. Summer of 1983. Robert Hansen comes up with a plan he calls his Summer Project. He planned and paid for his wife and two children to go on a long European vacation. He then placed ads in the local singles newspaper looking for women. One of the ads said, join me in finding what's around the next bend over the next hill. That's okay. This is the period of time, if you remember from the beginning of the episode, June 13th, 1983, when Cindy Paulson is attacked and taken to his house. The reason he was able to take her there is because he had sent his wife and kids away for the summer so he could do what he wanted. This same summer, many other women met their death at the hands of Robert Hansen as well. September 2nd, 1983. A road construction crew is working near the Knick River, clearing land for what will become roads and a new development in the area. As the crew is moving dirt around, preparing to build a road, 
A worker spots a human skull in the bucket of a bulldozer. The police are called and they realize this body was dumped very close to where Sherry Morrow had been found. The remains are identified as Paula Golding, only 17 years old, who had been working as a secretary, but after losing her job had turned to dancing to get by. She had been shot in the back, but there were no bullet holes in her clothing, which suggested that she had been shot while naked and then redressed before being buried. Paula had been missing for five months. It is at this point in time, months after the Cindy Paulson incident, that police begin to put the pieces together. They have all noticed a sharp uptick in reports of missing women, especially women who worked as dancers or prostitutes. And again, several of those bodies had been found in the area of the Kinnick River. Officer Greg Baker, the officer who believed Cindy, continually insisted that something must be done about Robert Hansen, but the investigation had been officially suspended by the Anchorage Police Department. Now they've got multiple bodies and the many missing persons cases on top of that. They've got the Cindy Paulson incident, which is still weighing on the mind of Officer Greg Baker. It is finally decided that something bigger is going on here and the Alaska State Police sets up a task force to look into the murdered and missing women. Now, the state police is different from the Anchorage Police Department. Because the women's bodies were being found in different locations, the investigation fell under the state police jurisdiction. One of the goals of the task force was to find a common thread that ran through all of the cases, maybe something all of the victims had in common. They felt that was their best chance of finding a suspect. Police actually went onto the streets of Anchorage and warned prostitutes and dancers that there was a dangerous killer on the loose and they needed to be very careful. Back in 1983, all police departments didn't talk to each other on a digital network the way they do now. So when police first looked into Robert Hansen's background, when Cindy Paulson claimed he abducted her, they didn't find all of his arrests. They only saw the 1971 convictions for abduction and, and the theft charges. Now, I'm sorry, but that should have been enough. Officer Greg Baker continues digging into Robert Hansen's past, even though his department has closed the case. As he's investigating, he finds the arson charge from back in 1960 from a different state. Officer Baker cannot bring this information to his commanding officer because Anchorage Police does not have an official case open. So even though he was risking his job, he took his findings to the state police task force kind of going over the heads of his own supervisors. Officer Baker begins to work with the task force and the state police agree, Robert Hansen is their best suspect, but they have a problem. There's just no evidence. They know he is a sex offender and they're dealing with homicides and they have no evidence to tie him to any of the homicides. Even Cindy's case doesn't really help them there. They have to find a way to tie him to these murdered women. At this point in time, they have three murder victims, 12 additional missing women, and about 20 reported rapes. The task force then decides to ask the FBI for help. They were aware of this new science called profiling and wanted to see if this brand new type of investigative tool could help them make their case. Profiling pioneer John Douglas was asked to assist on the case and he told the task force that he wanted only the facts of the case. He did not want to know anything about suspects or people that had been looked at as suspects. John Douglas and other profilers develop a profile for the Alaska killer. The state troopers are surprised at how detailed the behavioral profile is that they get back from the FBI. The profile for the Anchorage killer reads that he would be able to function unnoticed within the community. It said this would be a man who worked independently and would most likely be his own employer or own his own business. The profile said that the killer would be an avid outdoorsman, someone familiar with the wilderness area where the bodies were being found. It said the man would have low self-esteem, difficulty speaking to women, and that he would feel like an outcast and most likely have a history of arson. But the thing that shocked the Anchorage task force the most was one of the last things to be mentioned in the profile. It said that the killer would either have a stutter or a lisp so severe that it caused him embarrassment and a deep-seated hatred for people who had rejected him because of this difference. The profile fits Robert Hansen so specifically that the task force decides to do something that has never been done before. 
the leaders of the task force decide to ask the district attorney and a judge for a search warrant based solely on the FBI profile. This was a huge risk, and like I said, it was something that had never been attempted. The task force members also contacted Cindy Paulson and asked her for help, and she graciously said she would do what she could. Police also found one of the additional victims from Robert Hansen's past, and she agreed to testify if Robert Hansen ever went to trial. Around this same time, Officer Greg Baker began sitting in his patrol car outside of Robert's bakery. While at work, Robert stood in a window, visible to the public outside, as he decorated cakes, and Officer Baker said he quite enjoyed sitting in his car, staring at Robert Hansen, watching how nervous it made him. As a last attempt to convince the judge to issue a search warrant with no real evidence, profiler John Douglas agreed to fly to Alaska and meet with the district attorney on how to proceed. Douglas was confident that Robert Hansen was the killer, and he told the district attorney to ensure that he included in the warrant that they were looking for items belonging to the victims, as Douglas was sure this serial killer would be keeping trophies taken from those people. To their relief, their request for a search warrant was granted. October 23, 1983. Investigators position themselves outside of Robert Hansen's bakery and wait. As he pulls into the parking lot and steps out of his car, Robert is told he needs to come to the station for questioning. They are hoping to elicit a confession from Hansen, and they set up an interrogation room surrounded by photographs, maps, and evidence. As the interview begins, the officers follow John Douglas's instructions on how to question a man like this. Robert Hansen immediately begins asking questions, fishing for information on what they knew. As Robert is being questioned, the search warrants are presented to Robert's wife at his home and the officers begin to go through the home. They go top to bottom through every room in the house. Additional officers go to Robert's bakery and to the airport where he keeps his plane and begin searching. Nothing helpful is found at the bakery or in the plane, but the house search is continuing. Investigators inside Robert's house make their way through the ground floor and up to his bedroom. Hidden near the headboard of his bed, tucked away in a box, is an aerial map of the Anchorage region and outlying wilderness. The map is covered with red X's written in marker. Investigators count the marks. There are 37 red X's. Investigators note that the X's are clustered around where the bodies had been found, but they had only discovered three bodies. Officers then continued the search into the attic of Hansen's house. Hidden under the insulation in the attic were more guns. Two of the guns matched weapons used in the murder of Sherry Morrow and the gun described during the abduction of Cindy Paulson. Then, seeing the flurry of police activity, a woman, a neighbor, comes to the house of Robert Hansen and tells the investigators something very important. Her husband, Robert's friend, John Henning, that provided the alibi for Robert on the day of Cindy's abduction, John had lied. Robert had called him and asked him to lie for him, and he did it, not realizing just how serious the accusations against Robert were. Robert Hansen's alibi for Cindy Paulson's abduction evaporated. As the police speak with John Henning's wife, a call comes from the attic. An officer has uncovered a box full of trophies taken from the victims. Sherry Morrow's arrowhead necklace, the one she never took off, it is there in a box of jewelry and other souvenirs taken from different victims. They've got him. Back at police headquarters, Robert Hansen is still being questioned. He begins to talk about his anger. He speaks about feeling like an outcast as a child, his rage towards women who rejected him, and his disgust at prostitutes, especially those who tried to raise their prices thinking they were worth more money. He flatly denied hurting any of the women, let alone murdering them. The interview had been dragging on for hours, and Robert Hansen showed no signs of confessing. But then, a call came into the police department from the team conducting the search warrant. The officers interrogating Robert Hansen informed him of what the search team had found. He went quiet and stopped talking. They informed Robert that they now had enough evidence to arrest him and he is taken into custody. His bail is set at half a million dollars. 
With Robert Hansen sitting in jail, investigators had the time they needed to begin building their case. Three of the red X's on Robert Hansen's map exactly matched where the three known bodies had been discovered. Another X marked the location where a body had been discovered by Seward, Alaska police many years earlier. This, of course, did not account for the many other X's on the map, but police set about building a case against Robert Hansen for the murder of the four women who had been found. Finally, Robert Hansen acquiesced and admitted he was the killer. The announcement was made in the press and the media began calling him the Butcher Baker. As the killer began to talk, he said he would confess to the four murders that could be proven as long as his trial received no publicity and his family was not forced to get involved. He also demanded to be placed in a prison outside of Alaska when the trial was over. In exchange for his demands, he would show the troopers where more bodies were buried. Robert began to explain that he would take women off the street, handcuff them, put them at his house or other locations, and then he would put them in his plane, fly them into the wilderness, and hunt them like game. He would turn them loose and tell them to run. He would often shoot the women to wound them, but not to kill them, keeping them alive so he could continue to hunt them. He admitted that he committed more than 30 rapes over the years. Sometimes he would pretend to be a photographer and offer to pay the women for taking their photos. He would meet the women at fast food restaurants, get them into the car with him, and then he would snap the handcuffs on his victims as soon as they were in the car. February 27, 1984. Robert Hansen is convicted of the four murders he agreed to plead guilty to and was sentenced to 461 years plus life in prison with no chance of parole. After he was sentenced, Robert Hansen was periodically taken out into the wilderness with troopers to find more of his victims. A total of eight additional victims were found with evidence leading to many more. So officially, he has 17 known murder victims and over 30 rapes. The state did not want to pay to find all of the bodies, and some of them had been scavenged by bears, so their remains could not be found. We will probably never know how many actual victims the butcher baker killed. John Douglas said that the 37 red X's on the map might only be a portion of the women that Robert Hansen killed. Douglas said that for serial killers, the fantasy is everything, and if the killer ends up not liking a victim or the way the kill occurred, he may not record it as part of his fantasy memorabilia. So there is no way of knowing how many women lost their lives to this monster. This story was made into a film in 2013 called The Frozen Ground. It stars Vanessa Hudgens, Nicolas Cage, and John Cusack. I rented it as part of my research for this episode, and while it's not a masterpiece of film, it's a decent watch if you're interested in this case. It's as much fiction as it is fact, but it does touch on the main elements of these appalling crimes. August 21st, 2014. Robert Hansen died in custody at Alaska Regional Hospital due to natural causes from lingering health conditions. He was 75 years old. There is no way of knowing how many bodies still lay out under the skies of the Alaskan wilderness, the bodies of women unfortunate enough to come into contact with the Butcher Baker serial killer. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. I sure appreciate you watching. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with me today. I sure hope you're well. Like the video if you would and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. It helps me out a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.